Welcome back for part two of the great lie about the Crusades. The Muslim movement against Europe did not just go through the Mediterranean. It also went up through the mountains at the border of Europe and Asia. At the time that part of Asia was controlled by the Hungarians and the Polish, who, having already had to deal with the Huns, and the Mongols would also, at a later date, have to deal with the Ottoman Turks. A new caliphate that formed in the Middle East after the Crusades ended, then moved into Europe with the intent on taking over all of Europe and its Christian lands. I learned this when I traveled to Poland last December and went through the palace in Krakow where there are paintings about this event. I also noticed Ottoman-style tents, hats, and weapons, and, although I don't speak Polish, was able to piece together through what there is to see there that the Polish had had great dealings with the Ottomans. Now, we know from other things, uh, other movies, events, and historical recollections, that the Ottomans had pushed into the Balkan Peninsula, from their empire in the Middle East, having retaken the Holy Land in its entirety from the Christian nations and pushed into the Balkans. The history and the mystery surrounding Vlad the Impaler is that when the Ottomans sent him envoys and demanded his capitulation and subservience, he beheaded them, drank their blood, and sent that back, hoping to scare the Ottomans out of his lands. The Christian peoples of, the, of Eastern Europe had already, having faced the Huns, decided that they needed to band together if they were to resist any of these incursions. But owing to strife between the Austro-Hungarian Austro Empire and its surrounding neighbors, there was no push for unity at this time. I learned from my time in Poland that the Ottomans seemed to have been able to make it all the way to the Baltic Sea. They didn't hold it for very long, but they did sack the capital of Poland, made it to Gdansk, and then were somehow pushed back. I do not know how. There's a painting in the royal palace in Krakow depicting the Battle of Vienna. And a week later, when I was in Vienna, and a family I knew took me to the top of Kopfenberg, I asked uh, Alex, what's this monument up there to the slaughter at Kopfenberg? And he said, oh, that was the battle where the Ottomans came after the Austrian Empire and just about took the city and then an army arrived from the north and saved us. Alex did not know what army this was. I did, because the week before I'd been in Poland, it was the Polish army. The king of Poland, having decided, having faced the Turks already in his land and pushed them out. Sorry, Turk is a pejorative term. I'm going to try and use Ottoman, because that's what they call themselves. Turk is actually a pejorative, so I'm not really sure why they let us them call us Tur they they let us call them Turkey. But anyway, another historically weird thing I've learned that they needed to bond together with other Christian kingdoms in the area if they were going to successfully defeat the Ottoman incursion. If you look at the Polish army, you can see that they took lots of trophies from their victories against the Ottomans. In the palace, there are several. Um, ex extravagant tents that they captured from prominent Ottoman officers. They adorned themselves with Ottoman hats, used Ottoman weapons. These were all evidence of conquest, evidence of victory against the Ottoman oppression. Eventually, Poland and Lithuania would band together to create a new eastern border, but this was against the Rus, and that's another story that has nothing to do with Islam and Christianity. Eventually, the, with these victories under their belts, the combined powers of, of Eastern Europe were able to push the Ottomans back out of the Balkans and back across the peninsula into modern-day Turkey. They continued to hold Constantinople, I mean Istanbul, because you can't go back to Constantinople once it's turned into Istanbul, because it was a significant fortress, and they consoled themselves that they had driven them out of most of their territory. The so the lie continues that we somehow, as Christians, are taking war to them. If the Ottoman Empire had successfully managed to get all the way to the Baltic Sea, 
if the Ottoman Empire had managed to take advantage of the fractured relationships between Eastern Christian kingdoms, such as Poland, Austria, Hungary, and the Romanian Empire, or Kingdom of Romania, sorry, they didn't have a, really an empire, um, they might have been able to push into Europe like the Huns and the Mongols wish they had. The Hungarians, however, also played a part in this because they knew what it was like to come in having successfully invaded and then stayed. They were welcomed because the Hungarians, unlike the other invaders who had come to Europe, had stayed and adopted the Christian style. Now, the Hungarians had a different fighting style, their own dress, their own weaponry. Uh, it made probably for some complications in combat, but they had already dealt with the Mongols and they were willing to continue to help their Christian neighbors and allies in driving out the Ottoman menace. Notice if you think about this, that you do not see any push by the Christians into Ottoman lands, despite the fact that the Ottoman Empire occupied lands that had once belonged to the Eastern Roman Empire, the Greek Orthodox, or the West, Eastern Orthodox Church, yeah, Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church, depends on where you go, what it's called, um, that those had been once lands belonging to the Christians. Now, not all the way down to the Holy Land that had always been um, contested land. It had not actually been part of the uh, Byzantine Empire. But when the Byzantines collapsed, the Ottomans laid claim to everything, even though it had once been Christian lands. Again, if you think back to the Crusades, when the Crusades passed through the Byzantine Empire, they also attacked it, sacked some of its cities. And so there had always been this conflict between Christianity. So what this lesson teaches us is that other ideologies have taken it upon themselves to come after a fractured Christian unit. We find Christians attacking each other, France versus England back then, and now Baptists versus Anglicans, Catholics versus, I don't know, what do you want, Lutherans, Mormons versus the, the community of Christ, whatever you want to call th these groups that are now in contentious discourse with one another who do not come together and bind together as Christians against their oppressors. And because we have this political movement to abuse Christian principles in the advancement of things that are not in Christian interests. Organizations will try to abuse Christian morality and charity in order to get them to give things to those who would riot in our blood and hunt us from the earth. People who don't respect us, who don't respect our laws, and who have no intention of adopting our culture, our beliefs, our values, and our norms. There are politicians in America and politicians in the UK who are openly what's the best word, who are openly agitating against Christian beliefs and Christian peoples, who are secretly or openly at war with the ideals that made Western society what it is, and who are attempting to use Christian principles to ensconce and establish their laws known as Sharia law. Now, there are some things in Sharia I agree with, but most of Sharia is an oppressive and tyrannical way of living, not unlike what you see if you read the Old Testament, which is con expressly contrary to Christianity, which is trying to live the higher, holier way brought by Christ that did away with the law of Moses and the law of Sharia. So, again, we have this big lie that somehow the Christian European powers have been invading and interfering with the Muslim lands. Fast forward to World War I. By this time, the European powers have earned once again their reputation, not because they initiated it, but because in response to that and to the fall, excuse me, <coughs> and weakening of the Ottoman Empire have now established colonies in the region. In World War I, there were movements, uh, again, not religious, to engage individuals there on the behalf of the powers in World War I. Enter Lawrence of Arabia, for example, who went to Arabia and tried to stir up the Arabs against the Ottomans to weaken them against the British. Again, not a religious thing, because the Arabs share a religion with their Ottoman 
overlords. Funny, huh? Colonel Lawrence manages to raise an Arab army on the promise of loot, again, not about religion, that then weakens the Ottoman position and helps Britain to gain dominance in World War I. Thus, the Ottoman Empire comes to its zenith and collapses in upon itself. In World War II, again, not about religion, but about power and money, the Axis powers court the powers, the Muslim powers of the Middle East, in order to create some sort of world hegemony, not based on religion, but based on a political ideology. With those attempts from World War I and World War II abolished, now we see a reversion of the Muslim world to world conquest under the auspice of their religious beliefs rather than geopolitical ones. In doing this, they use Christianity against itself to abuse and strong-arm Christians into doing things that are not in their best interest that are serving the Muslim interest. There have been many lies told about the relationship between Christianity and Islam. Perhaps the biggest problem with both of these is that many of the proponents and the adherents of both of these religions have never taken the time to read the books on which their religions are predicated. Many Christians don't know the Bible. Most Muslims don't probably know the Quran. And I know most Muslims don't read our book and we don't read theirs partially because it's hard to find a reliable translation in a language that we speak since those are not books that are popularly translated between the Latin derivatives of Europe and the Arabic derivatives of the Middle East. And so it becomes very difficult to understand one another and to come to terms with what have become now religious dissensions and differences between two of the most strong-willed, religious movements on the face of the earth today. The lie, however, continues to be told that we are somehow the oppressors. The invasion of Iraq, the occupation of Afghanistan, the assistance of Israel, all of which is used to justify Arabic retaliation and violence on the auspice that they're just trying to get back at us for the things that we did to them. The problem, again, that we see is that parents are teaching their children to hate other people. An offense that I did not give, given by people no longer alive to be offended. I do not know anyone anymore. I have no family, and I didn't even when they were alive, who was involved in the war in Europe. I do not know anyone, nor am I related to anyone as far as I know, involved in any of the Crusades. And so this hatred between them and me is completely and utterly illegitimate. Even if I were related to them, am I supposed to forever suffer for the sins of people I did not ever meet and in, whose, and in the decisions of which I had no say? This does not seem consistent with God's will, regardless of what religious affiliation to which you ascribe yourself. I do not think that whichever God you follow would be pleased if you perpetuate a lie or if you act upon a lie once it's brought to light that you have been lied to. I am not using these videos to justify the Crusades or the World Wars or the treatment of the Ottomans and the pejoratives that we use to describe them. As soon as I learned that that was the case, I stopped using them. There are probably still things I say because I do not know that are not correct. And this I am sorry. These things, once corrected, once instructed, need to be swept from our behavior, our attitude, and our rhetoric. If we are actually to be brothers under the umbrella of a God and creator of all men. Because it isn't just Christians who need to unite. It is all believers who believe in a God who need to come together and treat one another as if we are brothers, because we are. I know that it's difficult for Arabs and Jews to get along. They are brothers. 
They happen to also not share a religion. But let's not pretend that Islam is restricted to them and their family feud. If you truly believe that Allah is God, that Jesus is the Son of God, then there is a commandment inherent in both of those movements to treat God's children like they are God's children. As Christians, we are taught to, that we cannot love God if we do not love our neighbors. Now, this does not mean I lay down and let your people slaughter mine. It means I have a responsibility and a right to teach you correct principles and let you govern yourselves. And that is the purpose of this two-part series. There are things I have only recently learned that have put to light the lies I was taught and the lies that are continually propagated by our politicians for some sort of probably fiduciary advancement. Because let's face it, most lies, most crime is about cash and cash equivalents. The exact opposite of what we have been taught by our respective deities to worship in this world. When you find out the truth, it is incumbent upon you to change your behavior accordingly. If you learn about the history of these things, you learn that the things that we are being told are being told to manipulate us. Like I tell my students, it is always advisable to do your own homework. I suggest you do so. I challenge you to find out more about your own history, about your biases, your hatreds, your animosities, the bad blood between you and other groups. And when you find the illegitimacy that almost always exists to tell others and reject it, like you would cast off an old dirty garment and embrace your brothers as they are. Truly, we are all God's children, people of the book, and we have a responsibility to live up to the things that we profess. May God bless you as you do so, guide you as you seek his, his wisdom, and teach you what the truth is and how to recognize those who love and use it. Godspeed.